you've ever prayed, Father, I am willing to do anything that you ask me to do. Don't be surprised if he takes you up on that offer. Hi, this is Barry Phillips with 10 Minute Tour, day number one, the tour portion to Save. And we're going to go into Shemot or Exodus chapter number 27 and read verse 20. Before we do, let me just take a moment and say thank you. Thank you very much to all of you who not only watch 10 Minute Torah on a regular basis, but also you've shared this, this opportunity or these videos with your friends, your congregations. You've posted them on your social media pages, which you're free to do if you so desire. Uh, thank you for your prayers, for your support, for your encouragement, for your emails, your comments. I very much enjoy all of the comments that you uh, that you leave, and I read those and try to respond when I can. And uh, thank you so much. I encourage you to watch throughout the week. Now, chapter 27, verse 20, it says, And Yah is speaking to Moshe, and you, Moshe, you are to command the children of Israel to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp, this is the menorah, to cause the lamp to burn continually. Question, where did they get the olive oil from? It's not likely that there were groves of olive trees in this vast wilderness that was described as a barren place, a howling desert. They certainly didn't have Walmart to go buy it from, so where did they get the olive oil? Well, the only reasonable conclusion that I can come to Maybe you have something different, but I'm thinking they had to have sourced it from Mitzrayim, from Egypt, when they left. And one might ask, well, then how is it they kept the olive oil usable throughout that time period? It stretched to 40 years. How did, how did it work? Well, there was an example in Scripture where a widow woman served a prophet and because of her obedience, her olive oil was replenished on a regular basis and it didn't run out during a time of famine. So there could have been reasonably an expectation here that their olive oil was supernaturally maintained and increased and resupplied. That's a possibility. But Yah here says, not like he said in chapter 25, in verse 2, ask a contribution, a truma, from everyone whose heart so moves him. Now the word is changed. We're not talking about a truma, a willing, generous-hearted contribution and gift. But now the word is rooted in sav. It is command. You are to command them because the light for the menorah is so significant and so important that it has to be supplied. Therefore, my people are under a command to supply the olive oil necessary to keep it burning. So does Yah ever ask us too much? Does he ever require of us too much. Well, if you read from the book of the prophet Micah, he details for us exactly how much it is that Yah would require of us. He says in Micah chapter 6, verse number 6, With what shall I come before Yahweh? By myself before the most high Elohim, shall I come before him with ascending offerings and calves a year old? Verse 7, is it Yahweh pleased with thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my being? And there's a question. Verse 8, he has declared to you, O man, what is good. And what does Yahweh require of you but to do right, to love loving commitment, and to walk humbly with your Elohim? You want to keep it simple. You just want to do what Yah basically requires of us, then do what is right. The Torah tells you what's right and what's wrong. 
obey it. To love loving commitment. To lovingly keep your word and your honor toward others. And then it says to walk humbly. Pride goes before a fall. A haughty spirit goes before fall. Pride before destruction. So keeping a right attitude and a right state of heart goes a very, very long way. But let's also understand that there are times that Yah ups the ante, so to speak, and he requires of us things that maybe we're not prepared for. There was an occasion where, as a very, very young pastor, matter of fact, I just started my very first pastorate, and Laura and I were inexperienced. We were rookies. We were green. We were in over our heads, and I had just walked out of a situation where I felt I was really done wrong. And in retrospect, I was. Things were not done right. I was offended. My parents were offended. Those who knew what happened were offended. But in a, in a statewide meeting here in Virginia, we were in, in a state of uh, a worship service. And the Father spoke to my heart and said, you go to the one who offended you, who did you wrong, and you ask them to forgive you for the heart and the attitude that you've had against them. Oh, that's asking too much. I feel like I'm going to grovel. I'm going to get, I'm going to get stepped on again. But I sucked it up. I walked up to the person that had really done us wrong. And then to make matters worse, my heart broke and started weeping out of my eyes. So there I stand before this imposing physical man of, 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 of stature who had wronged me and slobbering and blubbering, finally got out, I'm sorry for the attitude that I had. And um, he looked at me and said, you got what you wanted. You got your church. You're all good, man. Don't worry about it. Yeah, you asked too much of me. But you know, later on when the foundations for that individual were cracked, crumbling and falling apart, and their spiral downward was with breakneck speed, I wasn't attached. It didn't cast a piece of dust on me. I was free from that. And looking back, I am so glad that I did what I thought Yah was asking too much of me for. If you think about Eliyahu the prophet going to a widow and having the audacity during a time of famine, what are you doing? I'm getting a few sticks here together. I'm going to build a fire. I'm going to make the last two biscuits in the house. My son and I are going to eat it. We're going to die. And he says, okay, make me wood first. <laughs> you make me a biscuit first, and then you make one for you and your son. Not only did he have the audacity of the Ruach Kokodesh to ask, she had the audacity, the bold, incredible belief to do what the prophet asked. And not only did she feed herself and her son, but also the prophet through the famine. If we go over to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 4, we read these words. Verse 7, And we have this treasure in earth and vessels, so that the excellence of the power might be of Elohim and not of us. What is he asking of us? Being hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, being perplexed, but not in despair, being persecuted, but not forsaken, being thrown down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body, the dying of the master Yeshua, that the life of Yeshua might also be manifested in our body. Wow. And I was looking forward to today. <laughs> there are times where life seems to be overwhelming, insurmountable, and beyond measure. But he is faithful. And if we will do what he asks, the light will burn. The world will be illuminated. Darkness will be broken. 
and Yeshua will be glorified through our shining. Be encouraged. We'll see you tomorrow. Until then, Shalom. Mm-hmm.